Prof Joel Pearson here for Future Minds Lab. I am a professor of cognitive neuroscience, which means psychology and neuroscience put together basically in sunny Sydney, Australia. So today, what are we talking about? We're talking about what is the consequence of having aphantasia or what are the side effects or does it matter in your life if you have aphantasia or not? A lot of people are interested in this. A lot of people reach out, ask, does it matter? Is that the reason my relationship didn't work? Is that the reason I didn't get a promotion? It's because I have aphantasia. So the answer to those two questions are no, that's not the reason. But research has shown there are some consequences and effects of having aphantasia. So the first one really is number one, emotions. The best way to think of imagery, if you have it, is as an emotional amplifier to your thoughts, right? You're thinking about something scary, an image pops into your head and that will fire up your emotions more than the thought alone, right? I'm thinking about a shark swimming under me. As soon as that mental image hits my mind, my limbic system, my amygdala becomes very active, much more than if I just think about that shark without a mental image, right? So it's a conduit between thoughts and emotions. So there's gonna be implications for reading novels, reading uh, any kind of thing, um, listening to audiobooks, talking on the phone, anything like that where your thoughts or words you're listening to may or may not have a mental image to go with it. So that's number one, emotions. What else? Uh, memory. So research is showing that episodic memory, which simply means memories from your life, are less details and less vivid if you have aphantasia, right? Sounds a little scary, but it's not catastrophic. There's significant effects, but it's not like your memory's wiped or anything like that. There are less details, and I said less vivid, less sensory experiences around your lifelong memories if you have aphantasia. Right, so that's two things. And then we have what's called working memory, visual working memory and things like that, which is just holding information for like 20, 30 seconds, really short periods. Now, we thought there might be deficits in that. We, that hasn't turned out to be the case, but if you're remembering visual information and you have imagery, you'll use your imagery to do that. If you don't have imagery, you'll use other formats and other words and numbers and other ways of remembering that information. So the format will be different, which just basically means if someone tries to disrupt your memory, you will be susceptible to different types of disruptions, but performance will be about the same. So you don't need to worry too much about that. So next on the list is empathy. What is empathy? It's when you're seeing someone else do something and you feel for them, whether you're reading a story and you feel for them. So it's tapped into the, the emotional stuff. People with mental imagery seem to score higher across the board in score in measures of empathy. So how might this play out in your life? Well, if you're walking down the street and someone's trying to raise money for a good cause, help the children who are starving. If you have imagery, it's easy to imagine those children suffering if you, and therefore you're more likely to donate. If you don't have imagery, it's harder to feel the empathy for those children. And we've run these kind of studies in the lab using donations as like the dependent measure. So there seems to be clear differences there with empathy, whether you have imagery or don't. Again, not catastrophic, right? I'm not saying if you have aphantasia or a monster or anything like that. These are small effects, but when you test a group, they are significantly different. So that's empathy. So what else do we think? Risk perception and risk taking is different. Again, if you're gonna you know, jump off the highest diving board in the pool and you're imagining yourself tumbling and hitting the water, and it's gonna be painful, right? If you have that ability to imagine, you may not do it. You can't imagine the scenario, the likely negative consequences, right? You're more likely to do it. And we've seen differences in that. So risk perception, understanding risk, again, with or without imagery is different. Again, these effects aren't catastrophic, but they're enough to, over many, many decisions, hundreds or thousands of decisions over your life to probably stack up and make a bit of a difference. So that's risk perception. Now, false memories is something really interesting. We know now that memory is not the way a lot of us think about it. Memory is not like a video camera and your brain's just recording everything that happens out in the world. You remember some bits and your brain reconstructs that memory. And so it turns out that if you have very strong imagery, it's easier 
for other images to make their way, to worm their way into your memories. So this is a big deal when you have eyewitnesses for crimes, for example. So here's a scenario, you witness someone stealing a car, okay? And you remember that the next day, you're telling it to the police, let's say, you remember it very well because you have strong imagery. And then they say, was there uh, a cat? Was there a blue car there? And you, because you can't help it, you imagine the cat, you imagine a blue car. And you think, no, I don't think there was. Then what happens is the imagery of that blue car and the cat is so strong that it attaches itself to that original memory. So the next day when you're trying to remember it, all of a sudden you remember a cat and a blue car. In other words, the imagery changes your original memory and that is the false memory. So there's a bit of difference there with false memory and eyewitness and there's kind of interesting implications to the legal system about aphantasia there. So mind wandering is a huge deal because really we spend a lot of our time, whether we're traveling or just sit sitting around, just wandering, mind wandering, thinking about all kinds of things. What we're gonna to do tomorrow? Did I leave the oven on? How was that thing I did this morning? Hey, I wanna do this, let's go and see a movie tonight. This is just wandering thoughts going through our head. So the amount we mind wander, and of course how sensory it is or how visual it is, is different if you have aphantasia or not. All right, so that's mind wandering, it's different. Now, another big one I haven't mentioned is PTSD. Um, What's wrong? You can fix your mic. Very uh. PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, that seems to be different, again, not only if you have aphantasia or not, but depending on how strong your Im imagery is. So we've run lab versions of this here, looking with it's an interesting paradigm. People come into the lab, they watch a scary, nasty film, and then we monitor how many memories, intrusive memories, happen that day and over the next week after that. And people with aphantasia have way less of these intrusive memories. So it's not really PTSD, but it's a model, it's a lab model of how we understand it. But there's a big difference in the number of intrusive thoughts between people with imagery and without. And last up, I want to mention creativity because a lot of people are curious about that. They're convinced that not having imagery, having aphantasia stops them being creative. Now we've done a bunch of tests on that. We haven't published that yet. And you might be uh, uh, happy to hear that there were no differences. So having aphantasia didn't seem to affect your creativity in all these different measures uh, at all. So these are measures like um, a brick, come up with as many different uses of a brick as you can in 30 seconds. So these kinds of things, coming up with new ideas, innovative things to do with different objects. And we saw no difference with people who have aphantasia and people with imagery. So this is a rapidly evolving field. Um, there's new research coming out almost every day or every month. Um, we've got a lot of papers backed up here in the lab, so they're gonna be coming out shortly. I think there's probably a few other things we're going to discover that are affected by having aphantasia, but here's just a sample of things we do know about already. So if you're keen to hear about more about aphantasia, from the science about it, how it works in the brain, or anything else about the human mind, uh, give us a follow, and of course, like this video, help share it with other people, uh, and I'll see you again soon.